traditional owners uh, and custodians of the land where I live, um, as well as the traditional owners of the lands where you are located today. As we share our knowledge, uh, practices within the university, um, I will pay respect to the deep knowledge embedded within Aboriginal community and their ownership of country. Um, you will have noticed that we're recording the session and we're going to have a format of all of our presenters will speak and we'll hold questions to the end, but uh, please feel free to put um, questions in the, the chat box. Um, so the Sidran Group here at Victoria University is a public intellectual space that's been surviving and going since 2011 now, I think, um, where we've brought together research activities <coughs> Um, and colleagues across the university to engage in um, thinking, um, scholarly investigation of new diasporas, changing meanings of displacement and identity, all very, very topical and relevant um, today in this very unsettled times that we live locally and globally. Um, it's an intellectual space where new questions about indigeneity, racism, refugees, sense of place, social inclusion, a, 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 a range of questions are raised um, debated, discussed, but we're also very interested in, in action and thinking about the relationship between university uh, community um, and our responsibilities to our communities in terms of promoting um, justice agendas. <clears throat> One of the themes within our programs, um, we've named coloniality um, and decoloniality. Um, this is an area that incorporates a number of projects uh, that focus on the notion of coloniality, which is to some extent the continuity of inherited forms of discrimination and oppression and how they're expressed in contemporary times. Um, so the aftermath of colonial violence, war, dispersion of indigenous peoples and ongoing global <coughs> migration present some of the contexts in which questions of gender, sexuality, class <coughs> and other forms of exclusion are, are, ex uh, are investigated. But we're also interested in inclusion and the sorts of ways in which we can expand our ecologies of knowing and knowledge and, and ways of being. So the papers that we have today are presented by three people um, who are members of the Sidran um, community, the HDR students, including ECRs, so the language of the university I'm using right now. Um, but they are collaborators in all of the research projects that we have been doing. Um, they are also embedded in agencies and our partners are here, Liz and Ralph, who host and mentor and nurture our students um, at Brimbank, um, CoHealth and, and other places. <coughs> so the three speakers are first Rama um, Agung Agisti and Rama will be speaking about uh, we are creating a sense of home, alternative settings as enactment of self-determination and racial justice. Um, he will be followed by Roshani Jai Wardena, who will speak about liberating methods, mobilizing community radio for community space and narrative making. And this paper will be followed by Amy, who is leading a project um, at VU on awakening to injustice, documenting reflexive anti-racism journeys in post-colonizing Australia. So no, without me taking up more time, I'm going to invite Rama um, to share his screen and start the proceedings. Fantastic, thank you, Chris. Um, now bear with me, folks. I should all hopefully be able to see my screen. So, Oh, so I think someone's just got their microphone on. I've got a bit of crinkly stuff coming through. All right, fantastic. Um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I am currently on, Wadjuk Nungabunja, and pay respects to their elders past and present. I'd like to acknowledge that these are stolen lands and its sovereignty was never ceded. Now, I wish to share with you today some insights from my PhD research, which is firmly grounded in the present documenting the self-determining and laboratory work of a collective of creatives from the African diaspora. But to wholly understand the work of this collective and their context, our context, we need to understand the lineage and legacies of this colonial dispossession that began with the arrival of British ships in 1788 
on Gadigal country on the east coast of Australia and the declaration that this was truly no man's land. It was the stealing of these lands that gave birth to the very idea of Australia, born from the British colonial project, founded through logics of this possession and grounded in global ideologies of white supremacy and Eurocentrism. Not only did this mark the dispossession of Aboriginal peoples from land, but also from culture and identity, as a whole people were subject to genocide, forced assimilation and ongoing marginalisation. Australia's story is also a story of many different migrations, but up until the 1970s, migration was strongly restricted to European countries in what was known as the white Australia policies. And whilst these policies were eventually laid aside, whiteness remains at the centre of national identity, shaping public discourses, institutions, and the experiences of countless racialized groups. A 2018 report by the Australian Human Rights Commission found that despite 24% of Australians having non-European or Indigenous backgrounds, 96% of CEOs, 99% of governmental heads, 97.4% of university vice chancellors and 97.6% of federal ministry have Anglo-Celtic backgrounds. Our present government cabinet consists of one Aboriginal man, whilst the remaining 21 ministers all hail from European backgrounds. Reflecting places of power, the media we consume overwhelmingly centres white identities, voices and stories. Whilst denigrating and racialising non-white identities, one report found that 57% of media pieces were negative when discussing race. This is particularly the case for Aboriginal people, racialised Muslims and people of African heritage. The following, which many of you will be familiar with, is a distressing example of the kind of media that was shown on our widely watched mainstream stations. Running riot across our suburbs. The new games police won't acknowledge. African games, do they exist or not? The latest attack just days ago. Home invasions, assault, robbery at gunpoint. I was dumbfounded. I thought I was dead. My hands are shaking. I'm just a shell of a person. Their crimes are sending chills across Australia, leaving lives devastated. I'd be having a panic attack. Do you admit that there is a crime problem? The major investigation on 7 Sunday night. People of African backgrounds have been subject to particularly virulent forms of media vilification, further encouraged by the political centre-right and far-right extremist groups. These discourses have created a context where 21% of people agree that African refugees increase crime. Where up to 77% of African migrants from particular countries such as South Sudan report experiencing discrimination. And where 38% of students from African backgrounds experience racial discrimination. These forms of structural exclusion, these discourses, these marginalizing experiences are the product of Australia's colonialism and ongoing coloniality our past and our present. For individuals from African backgrounds, these contexts shape everyday lived experiences and manifest in everyday racisms, the often small, pernicious, obscure, but pervasive ways that race seeps into the day-to-day. -day. My PhD research has been documenting the Next in Colour project, a self-determined alternative setting which through various platforms seeks to challenge racialized inequities. It seeks to do this through the development of safe and nurturing spaces that provide opportunities and mentoring for young artists from the African diaspora to enter the creative industries, as well as facilitating critical conversations, intergenerational dialogues, and building solidarities with other communities that experience racialization and its psychosocial, cultural, and political effects. The initiative was created by and run by Colour Between the Lines, or CBTL, a collective of creatives from the African diaspora that currently comprise of Anuop Dao, Geskeva Komba, Ezeldine Deng, Ruth Nyarawat Luach, and Yakia Ashwell. Together, drawing on their collective knowledges from their communities, from the work they have done and continue to do, whether within the creative arts, community development, or elsewhere, from their experiences of being African heritage in Australia, and from their engagement with decolonial understandings and approaches to inform what they do. 
Examples of just some of the platforms, events and spaces that have been developed as part of Next in Colour are Drop the Mic, a creative writing session led by young African writers, poets and musicians exploring the elements of storytelling. Medita and Chill, a series of conversations created by and for young South Sudanese people with the intention to build more meaningful relationships and understanding. The Colouring Book, a three edition digital zine which deconstructs black, brown and indigenous existence. And the activation of a physical space as a community resource to hold events, exhibitions, workshops and foster healing and relationality. I've accompanied the collective in parts of their journey, documenting their experiences and learnings of embodying self-determination and decolonial approaches across their different projects, spaces they create and the processes and practices they were developing and engaging in. For them, this is valuable knowledge to be shared within their communities and with other racialized and marginalized communities seeking to embark on similar journeys of creating self-determined spaces and projects. Through close analysis of interviews of the collective, important personal stories and collective narratives were identified, which show the many ways the work of CBTL is grounded in individual and community experiences. In documenting these narratives, the settings that they have created can be situated within the lived realities of structural violence faced by themselves and their communities within the Australian context, as well as the forms of knowledge they have collected navigating previous settings. It is from these experiences that powerful forms of counter storytelling can emerge. And it is through these narratives the collective name racism as structural violence, detailing the specific ways this is experienced and manifested culturally and materially with psychosocial consequences. It is this meaning making that necessitates the need to respond to violence and allows resistance strategies to cohere. For CBTL, these resistance strategies entail, entail the creation of alternative settings, home places and healing spaces for themselves and their communities to declutter. It is from these settings that CBTL are able to engage the decolonial actions of counter storytelling, authentic visibility and building solidarities and together to radically reimagine relationships and ways of working. For the collective, structural violence was acutely felt by both them and their communities through particular expressions of racism. Stereotyping and, everyday's, uh, and everyday forms of racialization work to vilify for the construction of people of African descent as criminal or deficit. Cultural products, practices and identities are devalued and inferiorized as particular ways of being in the world are constructed as lesser than. And blackness becomes commodified as individuals of African descent are rendered objects and their blackness consumed. Through the lens of whiteness, black cultural products and identities are defined and assigned value. These forms of structural violence constrain subjectivities and take endless emotional labor as racialized individuals and communities resist forms of misrecognition and misrepresentation. For CBTL, an important way to respond to structural violence is the creation of alternative settings or home places and healing spaces, such as the Next in Colour initiative. But also importantly, through the activation of a physical space from which projects and the collective can be based, and it is both for and shaped by community. In the words of Ruth Yadawat Duach, creating a space or allowing a space to be created collectively by community is so important because it's not only operated and run by a collective of people that understand the language of being marginalized and the importance of having a space to just be. It's like we're creating a sense of home. We're creating a space where you can be vulnerable and where you can deconstruct stuff for yourself. The creation of a home place enables criticality, healing, the fostering of relationships and cultural safety. Such a space allows for the maximization of resources. It connects communities. It is imbued in its own symbolic meaning of home place and of autonomy. Whilst there are many opportunities to develop projects, whether workshops or performances that access and utilize existing spaces, these spaces are both temporary and dependent on other organizations and institutions. It is not to say that important meaning making does not occur in such spaces or that it prevents collective forms of healing or the flourishing of networks but it is an impermanence that is linked to wider patterns of structural inequity and the devaluing of social identities. 
It is an impermanence that solidifies the power of white institutions as arbiters of control and upholds this arrangement for ongoing processes of misrecognition. Thus, the possibility of self-determined space shows the cracks in this logic and reasserts control over self and communities. From these nurturing and relational spaces, powerful counter stories to the damaging and harmful narratives that denigrate Africans in Australia can be surfaced. These are resistance stories that fight the negative representations of the dominant society and the inequitable systems they uphold. And they create resources for people to construct identities and understandings of the world, drawing on their own experience and knowledge grounded in community and cultural histories. Through the Next in Colour initiative, these stories are exemplified through various artefacts, such as photos, art, and poetry displayed in physical spaces like exhibitions and digital spaces like online zines. Across these different opportunities for counter storytelling, the initiative also seeks to build solidarities with other racialized and marginalized communities. Structural exclusion for marginalized communities translates to a scarcity of resources and opportunities, creating an environment of competition. For many of these communities, there are similar sets of racialized experiences perpetrated by the same structural mechanisms. In fostering these solidarities, engaging in cultural sharing and understanding, and connecting shared experiences within the Australian settler colonial context, exclusionary structures can be better challenged and shifted and new narratives created. Lastly, a key aspect of the Next in Colour initiative is deconstructing taken for granted ways of being and doing, and ultimately creating a framework through which future generations can self-determine and access important resources and opportunities. To work towards these goals, internal and external relationships and processes are equally important. The collective has had to conceptualize ways of relating with each other, other organizations, partners and collaborators and various communities. The collective has also had to consider how the organizational practices and processes they develop define these relationships, reflect their values and form a basis for their broader goals. For this, the collective engage a radical imagination from which they are working and imagining from a different set of ethics and principles to the settings which they are responding to. Relationships grounded in shared understandings and shared values are central to the ways of working that the collective are engaging in. It is from these shared spaces or at these points of contact that power can be better seen and the racializing dynamics better accounted for. I've begun to describe the Next in Colour initiative as self-determined activity that has emerged from a group of people who individually and collectively continue to be subjected to structural violence. This initiative is an alternative setting that engenders important forms of resistance and community making, and it is shaped and constrained by social power relations. Many settings which racialized communities and individuals encounter replicate structures and symbols of white supremacy. And so it is through the creation of new and alternative settings that safe and healing spaces for these communities and individuals can be constructed, fostering radical approaches for working towards racial justice and creating powerful counter stories that both resist and uplift. Thank you. Thank you, Rama. Amazing. We, we're going to go. We're going to go straight on to Roshani. Um, so, but if people have questions, please put them into um, into into the chat, and we'll return to them. Um, thank you, Chris. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'll start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm on, the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge the peoples of the lands on which you are all situated on as well. As we share our knowledge practices together, I'd like to pay respect to the deep knowledge embedded within the Aboriginal community, their long and continuing relationship with the land, and their ownership of country. I'd also like to acknowledge that these are stolen lands and that sovereignty was never ceded. The title of my presentation is Community Narrative and Placemaking, Mobilizing Community Radio as a Liberating Method for Racialized and Marginalized Youth. This project forms my PhD research and is being supervised by Professor Christopher Son, Dr. Nicole Oak, and Dr. Amy Quayle at Victoria University. My research is also being done in partnership with Brimbank Neighbourhood Houses, who govern council-run community centres in the western suburbs of Melbourne, Australia. The local government area of Brimbank, located in Melbourne's west, 
is characterized by a high number of migrants and refugees, known as an area that is considered to have low health and wealth, and is often perceived as a hotspot for youth disengagement, gang-related crime, and unemployment. Young people in this area are often subjected to dominant narratives that circulate within public discourse and mainstream media about who they are and what their lives are like. These narratives are generally constructed by those outside of the youth experience, incorporating very little about the complexities of young people and often painting them through a deficit and troublesome lens. Neighbourhood houses are known as community centres that welcome community members of all ages and abilities. Neighbourhood house spaces and facilities aim to respond to the needs of community members, as well as create opportunities to enrich their lives. The Neighbourhood House Unit in the Brimac area introduced a strategy and action plan, which made written commitments to supporting vulnerable groups within the Brimac community through the use of their Neighbourhood House spaces. One of their stipulated strategic goals was to support young people who experience structural disadvantage, particularly through the lens of race. With this goal, Brimac Neighbourhood Houses sought to understand how race functions to impact and exclude young people from community spaces and how their experiences of race-based discrimination may be addressed and alleviated. This began the groundwork for the current study within the place-based location of Sydney Neighbourhood House. Sydney Neighbourhood House is one of the Brimac Neighbourhood House locations, which is commonly labelled as a supposed hotspot for youth tension, as well as a neighbourhood house space where young people often congregate around but do not spend time within. To begin the familiarization process within the place-based location of Sydney Neighbourhood House, conversations transpired with young people in the area. Through these conversations, young people expressed that race was not the only other factor in their lives. Young people spoke of how their characteristics of ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, and socioeconomic status, as well as race, prevalently function within their everyday experiences. In a similar way to how race is constantly used to frame them, these categorizations were said to homogenize and limit how young people were viewed instead of encapsulating their diversity. These ideas about young people also hinder their sense of inclusion within community spaces, as young people spoke of how community perceptions about their youth and categorizations often led to constant stereotyping and surveilling within local neighborhood houses. This conveys how various identity positions alongside race simultaneously contribute to young people's disconnect and exclusion within local community spaces. Through these conversations, young people also suggested new ideas and ways of using the Sydney neighborhood house space. They proposed initiatives which were creatively and dialogically based with a specific focus on building their skills, sharing their experiences and platforming their multifaceted identities. Through actively listening and responding to these conversations with young people, the project pivoted to focus on how settings could be created and tools of praxis could be used to propel young people's stories and identities in light of and beyond race. Extending on the physical space of Sydney Neighbourhood House, and capitalizing on the digital turn in light of COVID, young people curated a digital space to creatively platform their identities, highlight their complexities and nurture their skills through the program of Brimank Live. Brimank Live is a youth-led digital radio station produced and presented by young people, particularly young people experiencing structural disadvantage and who are marginalized within their community. The program gives young people within the Brimac community the autonomy to curate their own radio shows within a digital space and use the platform to unpack experiences and issues important to them in their own ways. The current study followed the process of Brimac Live, aiming to emphasize how using the digital and community-based tool of community radio may give young people the capacity to create their own narratives about themselves. The study also sought to understand what stories and trajectories young people broadcast about their lives through community radio and how these stories and trajectories may challenge the ways in which youth are dominantly constructed and seek to create new narratives about young people. 13 young people were involved in the Brimac Life program. These young people were aged between 15 to 26 and had diverse characteristics of race, ethnicity, gender and sexual orientation. One factor they all had in common was their connection to the local government area of Brimac, as they were all part of the Brimac community. 
The methods and data used for this study were semi-structured interviews conducted with the young people of Brimank Live and the Neighbourhood House team leaders, focus groups with the Brimank Live team, as well as a radio show content, which was used as archival data. I also became involved in the Brimank Life program using participant observer methods, as I worked alongside the young team in creating the radio space and shows. This collaborative nature not only involved me as a participant in creating radio content with the young people, but also drew upon my own positionality as a young person of color who was born and raised in the Brimank area, a commonality shared between myself and many members of the Brimank Live team. The Brimank Life crew began by engaging in formal commercial radio training as a group, building their skills of radio interviewing, hosting and production. After training, the young people began designing and planning their own radio shows. On their shows, the young people planned to cover a range of genres and topics that were representative of and important to them. This ranged from showcasing stories and conversations about gender identity, racial and cultural diversity, mental health, sport, local music and community issues. During the planning process, semi-structured interviews took place with the individual young people of the Brimank Live team. The interviews explored the team's experiences of what it was like being a young person in their community, what deterred and drew them to community spaces and programs, and what their goals and ambitions were for the future. The interviews also explored what brought the young people into the Brimank Live program, what experiences and stories they were choosing to share on their radio shows, and what it was like being part of the youth-based team and leading their own digital radio space. After two months of intense planning and training, the youth-led digital radio station of Brimank Live officially launched. With pre-recorded and live content broadcasting daily through the Live FM app and webpage, young people's radio shows reached community and global listeners. After the initial broadcast, focus groups were conducted with the Brimank Live team to reflect on what they enjoyed about being part of the program what they gained, what changes they wanted to implement, and how the program was going to move forward. Through their interviews and the radio show content, young people recalled the ways in which they are dominantly painted and identified how they are generally othered within localized spaces. This ranges from aspects of their social and political identities, marking them as lacking or deficient, or their past experiences blacklisting them. They also spoke of how dominant narratives within the media often paint them through the fixed lens of their categorizations of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, and socioeconomic status. This shows how young people understand and are aware of the narratives that constrain, homogenize, and stereotype them. This also illustrates how consciousness does not need to be raised, but it is embedded in the lived experience of young people. Mignolo and Walsh speak of how being aware of and naming such notions illustrates resistance towards them and how this resistance is closely linked to the re-existing and rebuilding of new narratives. As young people were aware of how they were viewed, their radio space gave them a platform to recall the navigation of these dominant narratives. Young people conveyed specific stories about their lives, such as their experiences of being in the justice system, being racially vilified or profiled, and growing up with low income and opportunities. They owned and voiced these stories as their own, as they were not a product of what is constructed about them, but with the stories that they construct about their experiences themselves. As they spoke of how their facets and adverse experiences were seen to conceal their fate or lead to assumptions about what their lives and pathways would be, their categorizations and stories of struggle did not limit them. Rather, they were part of their life biographies and reflected notable aspects and points within their lives. These stories existed alongside accounts of young people's passions of pursuing music, playing professional sport, as well as set goals of going to university and expanding their capacities. This unravels, resists, and challenges limited notions about them, as it illustrates that young people are more than what they are categorized and homogenized to be. It also highlights that young people do not see themselves through the limited lens of their categorizations or circumstances, which is often perpetuated within dominant narratives, but they see themselves as complex and nuanced beings. The digital radio space and tool of community radio exemplifies the creation of a particular setting in digital form, which allowed inclusionary processes, as well as the possibility of narrative making for young people. The occupancy and leading of their own digital space 
expands ecologies to show how different modalities can be created for young people to assert themselves in their own ways and on their own terms. Young People in Brimac Lives or the platform of radio is a space to dismantle dominant ways of thinking that circulate through mainstream media and their community. The radio content broadcasted reflects how young people critically analyze the systems and limiting discourses attached to their youth and intersections. In light of this awareness, young people show a sense of agency and critical action as they work to navigate their categorizations and the discrimination which it harbors and reclaim and retell their complex stories of identity. Through this, young people emphasize that their identities are not nailed to imposed ideas or frameworks, but that they are multifaceted and assert who they are and who they want to be within safe and collaborative spaces. The study shows how intersectional anti-racist praxis work can be done digitally and creatively in light of known supremacies, as well as various dimensions of coloniality that include and go beyond race. It shows how digital spaces can act as liberating settings, which seek to resist different structural forms of racism, exclusion, and marginalization for young people. Within these spaces, the study illustrated how young people can propel themselves, elevate their voices, and ignite dialogue using community radio. Through this liberating tool of praxis, young people were able to redefine and resignify their lives in light of and beyond their race, whilst broadcasting and reaching people within and beyond their community. Not only do these liberating spaces and tools provide the means for young people to tell their own standalone stories within youth ed spaces, but in the process, the vehicle empowers young people to affirm identities, build self-determination, and broadcast new narratives about themselves. These new narratives challenge social lives about young people, demonstrating how liberating spaces and tools can give those at the margins the ability to tell their own stories, harness truths, and thereby enact epistemic justice. Thank you, Roshani. Amazing. I love hearing that, <laughs> that paper. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna go straight to um, Amy Quayle, and then we're going to have I think we'll have enough time for people to engage with the content and the speakers after that. Okay, Amy Quayle. <laughs> Hi. Um, thanks, Rama, Roshani, Chris. Great presentations. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Um, okay, so um, I first would like to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking from the unceded land of the Wee Wurrung and Boon Wurrung of the Kulin Nation um, and pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging um, and any Indigenous people here today. Um, I also want to acknowledge that this research project was funded by a um, IHES Early Career Research Seeding Grant, so just to thank I has for that as well. Um, and to acknowledge my collaborators on this project, Chris Son, Alison Baker, and Phoebe Miller. Um, so Rama and Roshani shared examples of community-based participatory projects that sought to create liberating settings to contribute to epistemic justice and racial, um, or epistemic inclusion and racial justice. Um, the project I'm reporting on here is was about learning from those engaged in this type of the work, the work of anti-racism um, in the current Australian context. So this project commenced um, in the second half of 2020 during the COVID-19 lockdowns as the Black Lives Matter movement regained momentum. So in Australia, we saw Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and other racialized communities, along with their allies, take to the streets to stand in solidarity, but also to, to protest local issues with Aboriginal deaths in custody of particular focus. So this was a moment marked by sorrow, but also hope. Was Australia finally ready to have a national conversation about race and whiteness? Now in 2021, um, with at least five Indigenous deaths in custody so far this year, we are re again reminded of the relentless cycle of grief that marks Aboriginal life worlds, given historical uh, trauma and ongoing structural violence. A national conversation is being called for about systemic racism and we're reminded yet again of the many recommendations that have not been actioned following significant commissions, inquiries and more, in more recent years the Uluru Statement from the Heart which called for, among other things, an Indigenous voice to Parliament. 
Um, for many, the lack of action reflects a willful ignorance of Indigenous dispossession and suffering, both past and present. So this research extends on previous research that I've been involved with um, as part of the Community Identity and Displacement Research Network, um, which has focused on interrogating race, coloniality, whiteness, and exploring community-based approaches, including arts and cultural practice and research as a platform for storytelling and counter storytelling, stories about oppression, resistance, survival. As a non-Indigenous white woman and benefactor of colonial dispossession, um, ongoing critical reflexivity has been central as I grapple with white privilege and the discomfort that comes with engaging in this space, um, including, for example, concerns about taking up or taking over space. Um, we've found that the term reflexive anti-racism useful um, as we see this as a critical approach to anti-racism. So we're aware that people describe their work in different ways and that there's contestation over the different types of terms used. Um, so central to the idea of reflexive anti-racism and why we're drawn to it are the concepts of racialization and reflexivity. And this helps to avoid the essentializing of identities and sedimented subject positions and counterproductive responses. For example, the paralysis or defensiveness arising from guilt that often comes with um, becoming aware of white privilege. And so it opens up possibilities for action. Centering uh, racialization and reflexivity means recognizing that we're all implicated in racialized social systems with power unevenly distributed. And we can, whether we know we're doing it or not, um, reinforce or counteract these power asymmetries through our actions. It means interrogating whiteness, which in settler colonial contexts like Australia comes with taking for granted power, privilege and normativity. Important, importantly, racism is always entangled with other forms of direct and indirect violence, exploitation and inju injustice, which is captured in the concept of coloniality. Um, pointing to the continuity of the matrix of power established through colonialism. So the work of anti-racism, we understand, is necessarily ongoing criti critical project and process of learning with different tasks for differently positioned people. And this has been described as co-intentional work. So this research, and it's ongoing, um, it's involved conversational interviews and qualitative uh, reflections collected through a Qualtrics survey. Um, we have 28 survey responses and have conducted nine conversational interviews. Um, and some of these interviewees also completed the survey. Um, participants were recruited through our personal and professional networks, as well as by promotion of the research on relevant Facebook groups. And this enabled us to um, hear from people beyond our own networks and also across Australia with many states represented. And participants were anyone who self-identified as engaged in anti-racism efforts. Um, so many worked in the academic space, though there were a range of other occupations presented. And they were also differently positioned in relation to race and at different stages of their anti-racism journey. So some students and some with decades long histories of work in this area. So today I just want to share some of the themes being developed from an um, initial interpretive thematic analysis. So I'll first discuss the um, recognition of race, racism and whiteness in Australia, which can be seen as providing the foundation for reflexive anti-racism. And it just gives a bit of a snapshot of how people are understanding how race works in Australia and what racism looks like. Um, and then explore how a reflexive anti-racism is being enacted. So the sites for action, its key features, and how people are making sense of the current moment and possibilities for change. Um, so participants spoke about racism in Australia as embedded culturally and institutionally. Uh, they highlighted the ongoing denial of racism and an unwillingness to meaningfully engage with the history of dispossession resulting in a national ignorance. Um, the high incarceration rates of Indigenous and African Australians and offshore detention were put forward as key examples of racist government policy that was understood as setting the scene for racism. In the uh, second quote on the slide here, the respondent emphasises the need to create a hostile environment for racism, which points to the idea that there's a 
currently a receptive social environment for racism. And this is further reflected in Emily's mentioning of racism as something that is sanctioned and to some extent revered. And this was captured in a whole lot of different quotes where people talked about it as being part of our culture, the casual racism. Um, a foundational part of reflexive anti-racism is this awareness of racialization, a historical consciousness that involves recognizing the past in the present, accompanied by an active process of deconstructing racialized subjectivities. Those positioned as white express recognition of their privilege, the taken for granted power they hold and feelings of guilt and shame, but not only as negative emotions, but as productive, pushing them to action. Participants shared encounters with racism, experienced or witnessed at different levels, um, from everyday microaggressions to more blatant and overt um, experiences of racism. They spoke of the pain it causes individuals, families and communities, and this included discussions around issues of colorism and lateral violence. Um, participants also often mentioned the natural affinity or camaraderie with racialized others. The example from Amelia points to the historical consciousness, a decolonizing standpoint from her social location as a white Australian. She recognizes her in complicity in racism, even as she seeks to unlearn it and emphasizes her relationality with those around her who feel the effects of racism. Uh, participants also share the various ways they enact anti-racism in both their work and in their um, everyday lives. And this included self-work, um, which involves challenging the internalization of inferiority or superiority, privilege or oppression. And this is not just work for those positioned as white within racialized social system. Um, while racialized people generally have a more developed racial literacy out of necessity, um, as recognised by Brooke here in the quote, they're not immune from reinforcing racism. It also involved the interpersonal work of calling out racist, racism, or as put by Jessica, the gentle nudging and negotiation to increase people's awareness of cultural diversity. Um, it also involves creating safe and brave spaces for support, networking and mentoring. And this included safe spaces for Black, Indigenous and people of colour, while others spoke about developing a network of values aligned people in a community of shared learning or a community of practice. Um, another important way participants were engaging with the work of anti-racism was by responding to their absences. And this involves um, decentering whiteness through the inclusion and centering of the voices, perspective, knowledge of those from positions of alterity. For example, amplifying the stories and ways and know ways and of knowing and being of black indigenous and people of color within the curriculum but also in people's homes and in their social media spaces and what they engage with um, importantly participants also emphasize the lack of representation of racialized people in positions of power as rama spoke about before and so the importance of creating spaces and opportunities within as well as beyond dominant institutions for Jessica, opening the doors to other people who look like her and providing mentorship is especially important. Um, participants in their, what they shared, they emphasize the work of reflexive anti-racism or however they describe their work as an ongoing active process. Uh, for those positioned as white, it necessarily involves embracing discomfort, but it also involves risks for those racialized by white supremacy. It is exhausting and emotional work and it's work that doesn't stop at 5 p.m. Um, many who identified as white were cognizant of the emotional labor that ra racialized people do and were mindful of not burdening them further by expecting them to teach white people about racism or, in, or by inflicting their white fragility upon them. So stepping back here was not about retreating, it was about understanding power and privilege and intentionally decentering whiteness to shift power dynamics. Uh, there was an emphasis on forging new listening position, positioning and this involved practicing a sort of cultural humility. Another key feature in um, what people shared was that 
the, the awareness of intersectional identities and the operation of power and privilege within communities and across settings so that it's very much more complicated than just black and white. Um, in terms of the possibilities created by the Black Lives Matter movement, some participants believed it raised awareness and reignited conversations, um, while others expressed concern about co-opting um, movements that originated in the US, or that it was just another social media trend with outrage subsiding as people move to the next thing. There was also caution against um, those practicing anti-racism for individual gain. So, um, the idea that people, some people don't do the real hard work of anti-racism and so pointing to a sort of performative anti-racism. So this is just the beginning of a largest emergent project. Um, the next steps are to take the findings back to participant, participants and facilitate intentional conversations around the, these themes um, and further discussions around how anti-racist solidarities can be supported. One of the key reflections so far has been how valuable people have just found having the conversation. Um, and it points to the importance of creating opportunities and spaces for in intentional conversations around um, racism and solidarity. Um, for some within our university, it highlighted the importance of connecting efforts and mapping the various work that is being done. And so challenging the siloing that often happens in large organizations. Um, importantly, these conversations must not be confined to the academic space or psychology curriculum. Um, our efforts have and will continue to be directed at connecting with organisations and communities as they seek to move uh, beyond performative anti-racism. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Amy Quayle. Thank, thanks, thanks to all of our presenters. They were really amazing, well done, um, rich and deep and meaningful presentations. I really appreciate that you all three agreed to uh, reproduce this year um, for our community. So I think we've got 10 minutes. We did book the time slot for 1.15, but I know that people might have meetings on the hour. So I'm going to, um, uh, just to open it up if people have comments or questions or reflections. Um, to maybe do that, do that now, and um, those who can stay on, um, the room will be open for a little bit longer. If you don't want to use the raise the hand emoji, there's lots of other new ones, so you can you can experiment with those. <laughs> I have got I I've got one question here, Rama. This one is. Um, um, asking you uh, for your, some of your thoughts on the relationships exchange between yourself and CBTL. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that was from from Mary, and I think that's such a, a, a big question. And um, uh, and it probably, you know, there's there's I think a lot I want to say about that, but then being you know aware of time, um, I think in terms of the relationship, something that's it's been. Um, a really important thing to sort of reflect on um, so far is that is the role that relationships and relationality has has played. So in, in sort of documenting the work of of, of CBTL and, and and the kinds of ways that they wanted to develop relationships with other people and organisations, um, I think it was sort of really important to draw on some of those um, those things and think about my own relationship um, as as being you know the person documenting those things but also as being a, a a researcher based in the university what what that meant and what that meant in terms of the relationships that that we had um so you know i think the project looked like um me sort of spending a, a, a lot of time um with, with 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 the collective and 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 i had existing relationships as well before going into into this project um but but thinking about I guess, yeah. I think. Sorry, I'm, I'm. I've lost my thoughts for a second. But, but uh, something. Okay, something that's been really useful is thinking about uh, an ethics of relationality and what that means to kind of instill that in 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 the way that we we work with different groups and communities. And so, thinking about uh, how we can sort of seek ways to be reciprocal in those relationships, how we can seek ways to have dialogue in those relationships, um, how we can build um, 
trust and trustworthiness, especially again coming from a, a place of, of 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 being a university based researcher. And so I think this is some of the thinking that I've been been doing currently in, in thinking about okay, where you know what, what does that look like so far, but then also where have those tension points been? Um, you know, where do we sort of start to veer into kinds of extractivist relationships? Where do we sort of start to veer into kinds of some of the the, the colonial ways that that, that research in universities have sort of worked traditionally? Um, so I don't I, look. I, I I don't know if that sort of starts to. <laughs> Thanks, Rama. That's a good go at that one. Um, okay, okay. I've got a question, KJ. Yeah, I'm just sort of um, wondering about. And Rama, well, you just talked about tensions then, but the, the tensions between like community groups and people of colour around the ways that they create space for themselves and create strength-based um, projects for themselves to, you know, shift up the narrative or push back against the dominant discourse. And the tension of doing that as a really good way to engage community and people of colour against the notion of shifting institutional systems and shifting power and you know it's really hard to sort of make a choice around either one or the other because sometimes um trying to do you know a whole set of shifting the systems and doing cultural awareness in that space just makes people think they're experts so i was wondering what people if they had any views around those sorts of tensions and what they see might come out of each of your projects in those space good Good question, KJ. So can um, I'll, I'll 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 we'll hold that question and just let Afra ask her question too, and then maybe the three of you can respond to that one. So Afra, do you want to ask your question or response as well? Sure. Hi everyone, and also KJ, my question very much aligns with what you asked. So um, what I wanted to know was how we can move from basically like project and like initiative based movements, which are very important for the community into it being embedded in structures and organizations, as well as how can we take the learnings, let's say from like um, the youth working the art space or like the community radio example, and how do we use their voices to be heard in key decision making arenas? So in addition to the safe space, there's structural change that's happening and yeah, they work together. Okay, th thanks. Um, Rama, Roshani and Amy, are you guys going to have a go at that or anyone in the audience? Um, but you feel free to respond to any of these questions too. Uh, just let, let us know. Yeah, um, I think those are really great points. Um, and I think it's, I guess these projects start off as a really good, um, I guess, starting base for, for this type of work. Um, I guess the, the social outcomes that come out of it um, sort of start the trajectory of um, how these spaces can lead to, to further change. So um, I know for um, my particular project, um, you know, it's a continuing project that we're hoping to expand. Um, we're hoping to, um, you know, have young people be paid and they have been paid during that process. But it's also, you know, other um, public organisations have, um, you know, been able to hear these young people's stories, have been able to, um, you know, get in contact with these young people and, um, I guess expand the, the impacts that happen. So I guess it's it's more of um, you know you don't want to look at it as a project and a project that has outcomes and kind of stays in one place, but you want it to be something continual um, and evolving. Um, and so I think it, it is a process, um, and it's a process that I think the university and the community organisation need to kind of work together to continue these kinds of things. Um, but yeah, I would say that it's kind of like a, a leap pad um, and a starting point rather than actual um, start and end point of an actual project, um, because the work is important and it's more about continuing this work rather than just, you know, saying that these yeah. great social outcomes have come out of this project and that's all we kind of need to do. I don't in, know, Rana, any, <laughs> thanks, Rashani. Any, anyone else want to have a go? <laughs> I, I, I think they're really important questions about, I mean, I think the, I guess the move from from, from project based, but the, the questions that you are asking to, to some extent, two cages that the need and importance of those alternative settings, the safe settings and so forth, but those settings don't always lead to change in the structures that are the, the ones that's producing the need for these alternative spaces. So how, how do you, how do you combine or how do you create 
spaces that can do both of both of those sorts of things. I guess the other sort of and, and Liz, maybe you have some ideas about this because this task is actually harder than <laughs> this change is actually harder. And and hence, I mean, hence the, the sorts of global movements that we've seen um, about people talking uh, about decoloniality um, around a new sorts of ethics about displacing dominant systems. And that includes the university. But what, what might those other places be and how do they become the places from which we imagine new things and alternative things but they not they can't be piecemeal tasks yeah and so so the needs or the the calls for for solidarities um in yeah, across it divides the the need for plurality uh, and so forth because a, a, a lot of the time the sorts of things that we we do are, are constrained and dictated by systems um, that want to remain the same um and so so this work is 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 I, it's it's not new work it's old work that's 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 even that's more urgent now i guess in, in some sort of way but but liz i know you've you've also have some sort of experiences i'm sorry for pointing you out i've got one screen here um <laughs> and i thought maybe <laughs> and i know that there's two people are going across two screens i thought maybe maybe you'd have some responses because i know that the the way in which we've been thinking about how do you support these sorts of settings mm. but then also how do you develop a strategic plan within an organization that um that wants to respond but also can't and and doesn't know how to respond um to some of the sorts of calls for transformation yeah. fear from people who are outside of the systems mm. yeah uh, look, you know, I, I'm finding that a really challenging space um, in a local government setting uh, because there's a, a certain amount of, I don't know, um, acceptance and tolerance of kind of anti-oppressive practice if it's community facing it becomes way more problematic when the lens is turned on the organization and its lack of safety. Um, and that's been, you know, that's been the hardest bit about putting um, race equity at the center of our neighborhood house community centers strategy is that, you know, it seems fine to create spaces such as Brimbank Live for young people and see all of the, you know, the great social outcomes that come from that, even though the discussion, you know, may well implicate, you know, implicate local government as being an unsafe place, which it is a very unsafe place. Um, but yeah, you know, when you apply the same thinking to internally all hell breaks loose mm -hmm. and that's that's where I am now <laughs> in, in hell in hell <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> thanks for sharing that reflection Liz um I don't know if other people have comments because I, I mean I, I I I can keep rambling on but I don't want to do that um, so if other people have observations or experiences um, that they want to share or visions that they have about how we actually respond to KJ's question by coming together um, over time to, to, to think collectively about, about this, that would be great. I think just for me, um, what came out of the conversations I had with people was just the importance of just mapping all of the really good work that's being done and the connecting and that's within the university but also beyond and I guess as in our role in as academics partnering with those organizations to do some of the work that they might not have the time and space to be able to do and and all of that kind of stuff as well and that yeah creating the communities of practice within the university but also beyond and sort of because yeah, it, it's a really one of the things that stood out in what people shared was the different experiences being an academic and doing this kind of work versus the on the ground people doing the work like Liz was talking about in terms of within a local government setting, for example. Thanks, Amy. Jean? I was just going to sort of say something similar, like Amy talk, in a presentation talked about those um, community connections and 
um, while you might have groups of people um, sharing an experience and, you know, solidarity within those groups, um, it's sort of like, it, it, you know, education of these issues has to be much broader to actually, you know, evoke change. And, you know, from an education perspective as a teacher, like, it, we've sort of got to start at school. We've got to start with little kids, with little people who grow up, you know, inquiring and critiquing, um, you know, colonization and and uh, and our history and um, and confronting it. So, I mean, you know, they, these are big and bold aims. Um, but unless we can all sort of start to jump on board in lots of different ways, and I think it's the same with organisations coming together and connecting. Mm. Yeah, thank, thank, thanks, Jean. Um, do do other people have comments? I know the ones who had to leave at two have left, but if people have other comments or questions, um, I think they're really important. There's there's multiple ways, I guess, because these are such vexing and complex problems. But I think they they are urgent for us. Education is one solution, and we all think about what our our spheres of influence might be, and and imagine if we actually put those together, um, how that that ripples out. And I think that's part of the that's part of the work that 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 we uh, would like to do through Sidran was to is to figure out how to hold people and how to hold this, how to hold the spaces for people to sustain this, but then also how to how to reach out so that we can have greater influence in the in the places where we where we do our work. So that's one goal and 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 one one thing that coheres the project um, that. Um, Amy Rama and, and Roshani presented is the long-term relationships that we form with communities of people that we are part of. Um, we're not separate to them, but we want to understand how better do we use the, the, the privilege and the resources of the university to, to, you know, to, to reach out differently, but then also to create the spaces uh, for where other people's knowledges uh, become as central as the ones that we get through the education system. So, so there's multiple avenues and multiple spaces, you know, for us to be able to do this sort of work, but these conversations are one way of, of, of I guess, connecting um, at, at this point. So do, do people have other other comments, observations, questions? If, um, if, if not, um, I just want to remind people that we're going to have another seminar on the, is it the 26th or the 28th? It's a Thursday, a couple of weeks from now. That's organized by Lutfia Ali. And the topic uh, this time, um, which resonates or maybe builds on or extends on this one, is about uh, the experiences of women of color in the academy. Um, so look out for that one and, and, and sign up. And if, um, if you or any of you want a, a space to speak and connect, let us know and we'd be more than happy to organize um, uh, a, a, a seminar or whatever format it is that you'd want to engage um, with, uh, with us. Um, yeah. Not, not <laughs> thumbs, up, thumbs up so thank you all for coming it's really great that you're able to join us and we appreciate that you made time for us thank you thanks everyone thanks presenters <laughs> thank you is rama going to stop recording <laughs>